a mole of gas, okay, and we'll go through gas laws later. So one mole of gas occupies 22.4 liters, which is what this is, and it contains Avogadro's number, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Avogadro never actually came up with the number. He just came up with the concept. It wasn't until later on that they actually got the number. So we call it Avogadro's number, but he never found the number. He just proposed that, hey, if I have one mole of carbon dioxide, hydrogen, it doesn't make a difference. As long as it's a gas, it's going to contain the same number of particles. I'll let somebody else figure that out. Okay. But, so here's where grams plays into this. So one of the mortal questions is that why is Avogadro's number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd and not 10 or 20 or 1,000? And here's what you have to understand. Is if I went to Skippy and I said, Skippy, I'm going to give you a scale. And I'm going to give you a pair of tweezers these are the magic tweezers, Skippy, that allows you to grab one carbon atom at a time. Okay? You can grab one carbon at a time. And you're going to start stacking these up on a tray on the scale. And I want you to stop, you stop, when the relative atomic mass, which is carbon, of tw is 12. You stop when that scale reads 12.00. So what they did is they took the rel, because the, the metric system was all the rage, okay? So they said, okay, because they already need relative atomic mass. So they said, okay, let's pick something. They said, we're gonna let the relative atomic mass be 12 grams. If I give this lecture in physics, they actually work off of kilograms. So a mole in a physics lecture <laughs> It's actually called a kilomole. And instead of 12 grams, it's 12 kilograms. And so Avogadro's number in the physics class is actually 6.02 times 10 to the 26th. Okay? But we're in chemistry, so we work in grams. So what would happen is that Skippy would begin to add these carbon atoms, one at a time, one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. Okay? And when he added the last carbon atom, at that scale rate, rate measure 12 grams, that's when he could stop. And if I said Skippy, how many did it take? You go to Mr. Burkamp, that would take 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms stacked together to equal the relative atomic mass in grams. Now, Evan? So, why did they change it? Because carbon's mass isn't it now like 12.01? But at the time, when they established it, they just said, we're just going to make it 12. Oh, so then they, then they found Avogadro's number, and then they realized it wasn't 12. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, well it, was, it was more of a function of the fact that they, there was a slight difference in mass between protons and neutrons. That was more of the defining moment than anything. So if somebody asks you, why is Avogadro's number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, you need to say, because the combined mass of that number of particles equals the relative atomic mass in grams. Okay, so once they figured out isotopes and relative percentages, so if you look on number six, okay, on that front page, what's the average atomic mass of neon if 90% of its atoms have a mass of 19.992, and that AMU stands for atomic mass units, okay, which is the fancy name for saying relative atomic mass. And then 10% of them have a mass of 21.991. Now, let's just make this simple. Let's say, we, let's say we had the quiz. And let's round this up to 20, and let's round this up to 22. Okay? And I tell you that 90% of the kids got a score of 20 on the exam. 10% of the kids got a score of 22. And I'm going to calculate the average, okay? EMA, is my average score going to be closer to 20 or closer to 22? Did you say 22? What? 20. I meant 20. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, 20? Right? Closer to 20? It's 20. Yeah, because that's the vast majority of them. Can I just okay? say this right now? No, you can't. 
No, I'm going to go walk. No, you're fine. Chill out. You're fine. So, here's the easiest way to do this. Okay? There's a couple ways you can do it. One, you can take 90 times 19.992. So, here's an option. If you're a mathematical purist, you can take 90 times 19.992 plus 10 times 21.991. And then divide all of that, find the sum of those numbers, and then divide that by 100, because that's what percentage means is out of 100, okay? If you don't want to divide by 100, take the percentages, change them to decimal points right away, change that to 0 0.90, change that to 0 0.1, multiply that by the relative atomic mass of those values, add them together, boom, you're off to the races, okay? Now, when you get to number four, pay attention to the terminology on number four. When you talk about mass number, okay, remember, mass number is the total number of protons and neutrons, okay? It has to be a whole number, right? It has to be a whole number. Protons and neutrons are sometimes called nucleons, okay? So basically what we're asking is, hey, What's the most likely total number of nucleons? Now remember, later on, at, this is after they did a relative atomic mass, they figured out that each proton and each neutron has a, roughly a relative atomic mass of one, and we can use that for rounding purposes, okay? In reality, they're not, but for the sake of this class, it's fine. So for the sake of this class, you can assume that each proton and each neutron has a relative atomic mass of one, and it just worked out that way. It isn't like, ooh, we planned that. We got lucky. Okay? It was an absolute luck of the draw that we assigned the atom relative atomic mass of hydrogen to be 1, and that's, oh, we're going to let that be the mass of a proton. There you go. Oh, so that first free response question is going to do that same thing. So you have a percentage of silver atoms have a certain relative atomic mass. The other percentage is 108. You know your answer has to be somewhere between basically 107 and 109. So make sure that your answer on number, on that first free response question is somewhere between 107 and 109, okay? Somewhere in that ballpark. Now, when you get to, where is it at? Let's talk about number eight. Uh, that, like that second number eight, okay? So, Here's the best way that I can explain this idea of, of limiting reactions. So let's say that we're going to make cheese sandwiches. And a cheese sandwich requires two slices of bread plus one slice, slice of cheese to make a synthesis reaction of cheese sandwiches. Okay? There you go. We're going to make cheese sandwiches. Now, here's the deal. Let's say that you have 10 slices of bread and you have four slices of cheese, okay? So you have 10 slices of bread, four slices of cheese. How many sandwiches can I make? I got 10 slices of bread, four slices of cheese. I want to make sandwiches. Why four? Your answer is right, but why? You need one slice of cheese per sandwich. Yeah, so what? You only have four slices, but you got ten pieces of bread. Yeah. So how many slices, how many sandwiches can I make from the bread? Well, if you have I five could, slices of cheese, five. But I don't. I only have four. So what's going to run out first, my cheese and bread? Cheese. Cheese, right? So here's the deal. Here you go. Perfect. You, have, you understand limiting reaction problems, okay? So, here's the deal. You can only make the smallest amount of product from the smallest amount you can get from one of the reactants, okay? So, what you have to do on number eight, okay? What's the first thing you have to do before you can even begin to solve question number eight? Yeah, you have to have the balanced reaction. If you don't have the balanced reaction, you cannot do number eight. Okay? It's pretty simple. Two hydrogens plus O2 yields 
to water. Okay? If you don't have that, you are just dead in the water right from the get-go. So there's a couple of ways you can do this problem. What I would recommend is that start with the 25 grams of hydrogen. Notice that that's diatomic, okay? Remember your diatomics, hydrogen and then like the match at seven, an awful brink or whatever, okay? Basically it's hydrogen and then nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine, down the halogen. If you have those by themselves, those are diatomic, if you're specifically told they're a gas. So take 25 grams of hydrogen, eventually come out here and roll that into grams of water. And then take the 175 grams of oxygen, and you're going to roll that into grams of water, and you're going to see which one produces the smallest amount of water. The one that produces the smallest amount of water is the limiting reactant. Okay? There you go. Um, when you get to that last free response question, okay, and you all did a problem like this on the review, but here's the deal. Change the percentages in the moles, okay? I just... Keep, I just change those percentages into grams, like assume that you have, have a 100 gram sample. Now, what's going to happen, and this is the bigger picture, what you're trying to figure out fundamentally is these subscripts. Okay, that's what you're trying to find. What's the ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen? That's what you're trying to find. Okay? So when you get to this point, just step back. When you convert those grams into moles, find the one that has the biggest number of moles, okay? Which in this case is going to be the hydrogen. So you know whatever subscript goes with the hydrogen has to be the biggest number, okay? Because that's going to be the biggest number of moles, okay? Now, this is, this is going to work out to an improper fraction, okay? You're going to have, if you do this right, you're going to have like one and a third, okay? It's like 1.33, because you change them into moles, you divide everything by the smallest number, okay? And it's going to work out to be a fraction, so your formula on that last one should involve some fours and threes. Cool. Now, here's how you can check that you got it right. Take your empirical formula and we work backwards. Find the, find the percentage based upon your chemical formula. You got three carbons, whatever. Find the relative mass of the whole thing divided by the mass of the carbon. See if you get that percentage. If you did, you did it right. If you don't, you did it wrong. Okay? That's as simple as it can possibly get. Okay. Is there anything anybody wants to be Jenna. Number eight on the list. Yes, please. Please. Which volume show the greatest bending in mass spectrometer? Okay. So, how mass spectrometers work, the short version is that mass spectrometers, you have ionized particles, okay? that you shoot through an electric field. So here's the best analogy that I could give you. Imagine that you have a blow dryer, okay? And it's blowing out air. Situation number one, I roll a golf ball across, okay, like this. And that air is gonna deflect the golf ball a certain amount. So instead of rolling, so, I'm, the air is blowing this way, here comes the golf ball, it hits the air, it's going to get deflected, okay? Now, situation number two, I take this small little plastic one, okay, and I do that. Now what's going to happen? What's going to get deflected more? That thing. What? Less mass, right? So, okay? Now, Another scenario. I've got this big mass of Hank, right? Hank, this is Hank's bowling ball. Okay? Now, imagine I'm rolling Hank along, 
and I blow on Hank, what's going to happen? He's not going to move that much. Not going to move very much. Okay. Now, notice on all your answers on number eight, they're all charged particles. Mass spectrometers only work with charged particles. They don't work with with neutral atoms because neutral atoms won't be deflected in an electric or magnetic field. So, basically, your answer to number eight because it asks the one that's going to be the greatest bending, find the one with the smallest mass. Okay? All right, anything else? At all? Yes? The first 10? Okay. So here's the story, right? So they've given you the mass of an atomic mass unit in gram. And again, this was extremely difficult to find. So imagine that you're trying to find the mass of a single proton, okay? Or a single electron. It is like we can go, oh, I'll grab one and I'll put it on the scale. Oh, here we go, okay? It's a very complex thing involving electric and magnetic fields. You make it like bend in a circle. That's the short version of a very long, complicated. So here's the story. So it asks, what's the mass of the nucleus of the most common isotope of carbon, right? So look at carbon. What's the relative atomic mass of carbon? 12. What's the atomic number of carbon? Six. So you're going to have six protons and you're going to have six neutrons, right? So on here, you've got 1.6605 times any negative 24th grams, right? So the proton has a mass of 1.0073. So basically, you're going to take 6 times 1.0073 and figure out how many AMUs that is, and then multiply that by the mass of 1 AMU. And then you're going to add those numbers together. Okay? Anything else? Going once? Going twice? First five? Okay. And this goes back to this whole idea. So let's say that uh, on the quiz that I just gave back, right? All the scores in that grade book are, even, are, are whole numbers. Okay, if you go down the score book, there are scores of 30, 24, 28, whatever, okay? But when I take the average of them, okay, the average score, let's say, is 27.4, okay? So when you get to this question number five, why aren't the atomic masses in the periodic table integral numbers? Mainly because of the fact that it's an average of all the different isotopes. So the atomic masses themselves are like whole numbers, but we can have an average that's a decimal because it's an average. Okay? Anything else? Go on, let's go twice so. So, if you are asked to be the buffer, you're mitigating the extremes, right? So, the same thing is going to be true of buffered solutions. So, buffered solutions mitigate extreme changes in pH. Okay? Now, to be a buffered solution, you have to have two criteria. You have to have, it has to be the weak acid, but you also have to add the salt that has the conjugate base of that weak acid. So, if you had, like, let's say, for example, acetic acid. HC2H3O2. So if you just have straight acetic acid, that's not a buffered solution because you only have half the criteria. <coughs> you just have the acid. But if I take acetic acid 
and I add, for example, sodium acetate to it, and that's going to dissolve in it because it's a group one element, so I could care less about the sodium. But now, once I add that salt to it, now it becomes a buffered solution. Now, here's what you have to visualize, okay? If it's a non-buffered solution, okay, if it's a non-buffered solution, on an atomic level, you're going to have a whole bunch of just the molecular forms of that acid, okay? That's going to be the vast majority of it, okay? Vast majority. Bunch of Hobbes. You might have, like, it might ionize just a little bit. You might have the occasional proton and the occasional anion floating around, but it's not going to be very much. That's what makes it a weak acid, is the fact that it exists as the molecular form. Okay? Now, if this situation, if it was just a non bar from straight acetic acid, and here's how you would work this. You'd go, oh, that's hydroniums plus my anions. Let's say that's a 0.2 molar solution, 0, 0, old school, minus x, plus x, plus x. You get x, you get x, you get 0.2, right? Old school. And if I said, hey, calculate that pH, you'd go, okay. K of acetic acid is 1.85 times 10 to the negative fifth which is going to be x squared over 0.2. Old school, you can find x. You can find, which is your hydronium ion concentration. You can take the negative log of that, and voila, you would have your pH. Okay? Old school. You should be able to do that problem without giving it a moment's hesitation. Okay? Literally, without a moment's hesitation. Now, we're going to change it up. We're going to take that same acid, same acetic acid, HC2H3O2, and it's still going to try and ionize into an anion, okay? But here's going to be the difference. If it's a buffered solution, I'm still going to have that 0.2 molar solution of my acetic acid. But now I'm going to pour some sodium acetate into it. So as soon as I pour that sodium acetate into it, What's going to happen to the concentration of my anions? It's going to go up, okay? So let's say this becomes, I don't know, I'll pick a number, 0.4, okay? I dump a bunch of anions in there, okay? And I want to figure out what that pH is going to be. Now, here's what's going to be similar. Your hydronium ion concentration is still going to start off at zero, okay? That's still going to start off at zero. You're still going to go minus x, plus x, plus x. This is going to become 0.2, this is going to become x, this is going to become 0.3, okay? Now, at this point, let's go back so we can make a comparison. So somebody take your calculator, that's 10 to the negative fifth. So somebody take 0.2, that's 1.85 times 10 to the negative fifth, which is the Ka of azotic acid. Take the square root of that and get me x. 0 0.001924. Okay? Now take the negative log of that. 2.72. Okay? Now, here's the big picture. Here's the big picture. Technically, this is your hydronium ion concentration times your anion concentration. Don't lose track of that. We call it x squared, and it's x squared because it's your hydronium ion concentration times your anion concentration, okay? Don't lose track of that. So, but it's important. And remember, Mother Nature's the lazy prima donna. Mother Nature's gonna do whatever Mother Nature has to do to get to that number, because she wants to sit back, chill out, smoke on a hoop pipe, and not do anything. Because that's when her, that's when she's at her lowest energy state. That's when she's in equilibrium. Now, we come down here to that buffered solution. Like, Rutro, we have we're trouble in little, little China now. 
So we have Ka equals my hydronium ion concentration times my anion concentration. Now there's two ways that you can do this problem, depending upon how much trouble you want to get into algebraically. Okay? One option is that you go, you still know what that Ka, va Ka value is, times 10 to the negative fifth. Now I only have one unknown variable, which is x. Okay? That's my unknown. My anion concentration is now 0.4. And my hydronium ion concentration is still 0.2. So if you want, if you're a purist, if you are a purist, the president of the KA club, good for you. That'll look good on your college application. Okay? You can solve for x. So you can take 1.85 times 10 to the negative fifth, multiply that by 0.2, and divide that by 0.4. So somebody do it this way. Somebody take 1.85 times 10 to the negative fifth, Multiply that by 0.2, divide that by 0.4, and let me know what x is. 9.25 times 10 to the negative 6. 9.25 times 10 to the negative 6. Yep. Now, let's step back. Let's step back, Jack. Okay? Notice this is 9.25 times 10 to the negative 6. When it was a non-buffered solution, that was 1.92 times 10 to the minus 3rd. 10 to the negative third versus 10 to the negative six. That's a difference of a thousand times difference. Order of exponent three. So here's what I want you to see. Y O Y, when it's just a non-buffered solution, is the 10 to the negative third. But if it's a buffered solution, why does that X become so much smaller? Ah, more anions, but I still want the same K Ka value. So what we've done is that we've juiced this thing with a bunch of anions. Mother Nature still wants the same Ka value because Mother Nature is the least prevenonic. So Mother Nature is going to go, fine, overload this thing with anions. Ask me if I care. I dare ask me if I care. Mother Nature is going to go, I don't. Because Mother Nature is still going to end up in equilibrium. But what's going to happen is that that's going to take a lot fewer hydronium ions to get that exact same Ka value, okay? Exact same Ka value. That's, you have to understand that. It's the same Ka value. This is how do you get there. Now, Evan, take the negative log of that number. 5.03. What'd you get? 5.03. 5.03. Now, Notice what happened to my pH. <laughs> pH has gone up. Why? Because there is less hydronium ions. There's fewer hydronium ions in that solution. Now remember, we only measure, and this is subtle, but it's important. We only measure pH. We don't have pOH probes. We don't have... P acetate ion probes? We only have pH probes. Right? That's it. That's the only thing we have, pH probes. So the only thing we can measure is the hydronium ion concentration. And the reason that we don't have acetate ion probes or nitrate ion probes or anything like that, because we'd have to have different probes for every possible solution. The hydronium ions are like the common factor. And that's why we always measure pH. Because otherwise, we'd have, diff have to have different probes for different anions, and it would just become daunting. It's like, oh, screw it. Let's just measure pH, okay? And if we figure out pH, we can figure out everything else from there. Okay. <sighs> now, that's if it's just the solution, okay? Just the solution. Now, we we'll have a buffered solution. Now, we're going to draw this a little bit bigger. This is now a buffered solution. So inside of here, you're going to have a bunch of Haas. The acid forms themselves. And you're also going to have a much higher concentration of anions. So I'm going to have acids. And because it's a buffered solution, now I'm going to have anions. Okay. So what this does is that allows me to deal with two situations. Let's say, for example, 
I'm going to add some hydrochloric acid to this. Okay? I'm going to add some hydrochloric acid. Your stomach, by the way, is buffered solutions. Okay? Your stomach and your body only works within a very small range of pHs. You want your blood and your stomach to be buffered solutions. You don't want to go to Taco Bell, eat a spicy burrito, and all of a sudden your pH drops to like three. Okay? <laughs> Bad. Okay? Or if you, be, you eat something basic, your pH spikes to like 12. Okay? Bad. So you want your body to exist within small pH ranges. This is why you are basic, you are basically one big buffered solution. That's what you are, okay? From a chemical standpoint. So here's the deal. You're gonna add hydrochloric acid. Now, am I gonna worry about the chlorine? No. no. Could care less. Not a part of the story. It's there, don't care. Happy for you, brilliant, don't care. So here's what's gonna happen. That hydronium ion, and that's the only thing we're gonna worry about, is gonna do one of two things, okay? Here's your potential things. It could react with the acid itself and form H2A plus, positive charge. It's an option. So the, the acetic acid would come along and says, hey, come back, hang out with us. That's another proton to the party, right? You can form that. In all your years of chemistry, have you ever seen anything like that? No. No. You know why? Doesn't happen. But, but, that anion is lurking in there. Now, not only is it an anion, it's the conjugate base off of a weak acid. So this is like Lonely Hearts Club, right? So that anion is sitting going, dude, chilling out here, the conjugate base off of weak acid, really, really looking to hook up. So what's that anion going to do? He's going to... Yeah, it's going to come up to that proton, sweep right, and you're going to reform the acid. So when this happens, what's going to happen to the concentration of the acid inside that beaker? What's going to happen to the concentration of the acetic it's acid? Going to go up. Yeah. It's going to go up. What's going to happen to the concentration of your anions? Down. It's going to go down. Okay? Got that. Now, so the, if you add a strong acid, if you add a strong acid, the anion is there to buffer it, okay? Now, what if you just had nothing but a weak acid? You had a bunch of Haws, right? And you just <laughs> add hydrochloric acid to it. What do you think is going to happen to the pH? It's going to go up or go down? It's going to go down. It's going to go down a lot. Why? Because you just added Hey, I'm just adding hydronium ions. There is nothing there to mitigate the presence of those free hydroniums. So what the anions do in a buffered solution, it acts as a sponge. It says, hey, welcome, welcome. It's nice to see you. Let's have cook. Okay? So this is going to be important. The hydronium ions are still there, but they're not free to move around because they're bound up with the anions. So don't give this misconception that, oh, if it's a buffered solution, the hydronium ions aren't there. They're still there. They're just not free to move around because they bound <laughs> up with the acetate or whatever that anion is off of that strong base. Now, here's the deal. So that's if I add a strong acid. If you add a strong acid, the anion reacts with the hydronium ion. Okay? Because it's the conjugate base off of the gas. Now, same buffered solution. We got Haas. We got anions. Okay? That's if we added a strong acid. So what's the, what else could we add? Instead of a strong acid, we could also add a... Weak acid. Strong base. Strong base. <laughs> 
sort of add some hydroxides into this thing. So think about this. What's the charge on that hydroxide ion? Negative. What's the charge on the anions? Negative. Think they're going to react? No. Nope. They don't want to be near each other because they're both negatively charged. So the hydroxide is not going to react with the anions. Okay? We're going to go, whatever, go away. But, what's that strong base going to do to the weak acid? Take it to Going to come up to it and go, hey, give us your protons. So the hydroxide, if you add a strong acid, is going to react and form water and the anion. Okay? So here's the story. So if you add a strong base, the strong base reacts with the acid to form the anions. Okay? So if you add a strong base, what's going to happen to the concentration of the acid? It's going to go down, but what's going to happen to the concentration of the anions? It's going to go up. Okay? So this is what happens when you have a buffered solution. It's a buffered solution because you can deal with both extremes. If you add a strong acid, the anion is there to act as a sponge to take that in and reform the weak acid. If the weak acid is there, you add a strong base, like hydroxide. The hydroxides will there. They're going to react with the acid and form that anion. Got that. Okay, stand up, take a stretch. We'll do some math. So, here's the situation. Okay, so visualize this. I've got a beaker in which I've mixed 200 milliliters of a 0.2 molar solution of sodium acetate and 200 milliliters of acetic acid. Okay, so... This gets mixed with this, okay? Total volume, there we go. 400 milliliters, boom, there you go. Now, here's the deal. To this, I'm going to add hydrochloric acid. So here's the first thing that you have to think through. Number one, realize this is a buffered solution. Care less about the chlorine, not part of the story. So what you have to decide what is that hydronium ion going to react with? Is that hydronium ion going to react with the sodium acetate, or is it going to react with the acid itself? The sodium acetate is going to ionize, and then it's going to react with the acetate. Bingo. I can care less about the acid in terms of the initial reaction. Can I cannot emphasize this enough. If you don't understand what the reaction is, the stoic makes no sense whatsoever. Literally, if you don't know what's happening in the reaction, you're just dead in the water. Okay? So here's what you want to look at. Sit here and go, okay. I'm going to set up this rice chart. And the reaction is going to be that hydronium ion reacting with the anion to form the acid. Okay? That's it. I don't care about the chlorine. Anything else? You have to start with that reaction. Now, I recommend that you work in millimoles because it's just going to make the math easy. So I've got 50 milliliters of a 0.2 molar solution of hydrochloric acid. I take 50 times 0.2, I get 10 millimoles. Okay? On my anion, okay? On my anion concentration, I'm going to take 200 times 0.2. Evan, take 200 times 0.2. You should get 40. I hope. <laughs> you do. <laughs> now, here's the story. You all are used to this side of the reaction starting off at zero, but it's not. So this is going to be, if I take 200, this is also a 0.2 molar solution of my acetate. I'm also going to have 40 millimoles of this because that's what's there to start with. Now, What's going to run out first, my hydronium ions or my anions? My hydronium. So this is it's going to work the exact same way. 
I'm going to go minus 10, minus 10, plus 10. So that's going to become 0, 30, 50. Now, at this point, I, I'm going to use that henderson hasselbeck equation. I'm going to go, oh, pH equals pKa plus the log of your anions over the concentration of your acids. Old school at this point. Okay? So if you do this, because it's acetic acid, the pKa of acetic acid, trust me, is 4.74, plus the log of my anion concentration, which is going to be 30 millimoles, technically divided by the total volume. Then I'm going to have 50 millimoles technically divided by the total volume. So the total volume is going to cancel out. If you don't really want to get lazy, you can cancel out the zeros. And you're going to take 4.74 plus the log of 3 fifths. Now, you're taking the log of 3 fifths. Are you taking the log of a number bigger than 1 or less than 1? So your pH is going to be less than your pKa because you're taking the log of a value less than 1. Evan? Could you also solve that by solving for your... Yeah, if you want to go old school, go Ka equals HO, you can do that. Okay. If you want to, it's more work, but yeah, you can do it that way. Okay. So what do you get out of this then? Then how would your X value be? Well, it's just going to be Ka equals H times your anion divided by HA. You know what your Ka is. That's your X. Okay, so H plus two. Yeah. Uh, you get a value of 4.42. 4.52. 4.52. 4.52. Okay? Cool with that. Now, here's the story. <coughs> you started, when, when you look at what your pH is going to end up with on a buffered solution, there's three things that determine where your pH is going to end up. There's three factors. So we can use this as an example. One factor is, what's your pKa value going to be? So in this situation, my pKa value is 4.74. I can't change that number. That's locked in place. Okay. So what this means, and later on we'll get more into this, so a lot of times you have to prepare buffered solutions. That's what you're going to do in the lab, for example. You're going to make a buffered solution. So I, if I want to take it, make a buffered solution of around 5, I could, I could deal with acetic acid because the pKa is like 4.74, okay? Now, if I want a buffered solution with a, with a pH of 8, I wouldn't choose acetic acid because I'm starting so far away from 8. So when you're deciding which acid that you want to choose, choose one with a pKa close to the pH that you want to end up with. So that's your first factor. Second factor is the concentration of your anions. And the third factor is the concentration of your acid. So in this situation, I'm taking the log of a value less than 1. As soon as I see that, I know my pH is going to end up at a lower value than my pKa is. If that had been switched and it had been 5 over 3, my pH would have been higher than my pKa. So when you look at where you're going to end up, look at your pKa, look at your anion concentration, look at your acid concentration, because that's what's going to determine where that pH is going to end up. Now, let's change it up real quick. Exact same situation, but now I'm going to add 50 milliliters of a 0.2 molar solution of sodium hydroxide. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to this exact same situation. 200 milliliters of my sodium acetate, 200 milliliters of my acid. What's the hydroxide going to react with? The anion or the acid? Yes. That's what you have to start with. Okay, so when I set up that rice chart, my hydroxide is going to react with the acid. And what am I going to get out of that? Water and the anion. You have to start with this. 
If you don't know what's happening in the reaction, you don't know what to do. Now, it's the exact same numbers. So if I got 50 milliliters of my 0.2 molar solution of sodium hydroxide, that's 10 millimoles. I've got 40 millimoles of my acid, and I have 40 millimoles of my anion. Okay? Now, all of that's going to get consumed, minus 10, plus 10. So that's going to become 30. That's going to become 50. So now, the only thing that's going to change at this point, I'm still going to use my pK. pH equals my pKa. pKa is still 4.74. Okay? That hasn't changed because it's still acetic acid. Plus the log of my anion concentration, which is 50 millimoles, divided by 30 millimoles. Positive. Ah, now I'm taking log of a value bigger than one. That's going to be a positive value. My pH is going to be bigger than my pKa. And if you do math, this math in the name of time, you get 5.14. Now, hopefully this makes sense. Here I added a base. My pH went up because I added hydroxide ions. The first one, I added a strong acid my pH went down because I increased the number of hydronium ions, okay? So if you think about it, like, ah, you shouldn't be able to get an idea of where things are going to end up. Okay, I'm done. So this is out of your textbook. I can see you. Can you use the restroom? Yeah. <laughs>